Hey everyone, and welcome to AMC Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Erin Darling, and we are bringing you all the latest movie news as well as insight into what it all means. Joining us today, as always, we have our AMC fearless leader, John Campia. <laughs> Greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to this uh, fine, beautiful day. Good morning, Erin. Good morning. How are you today? I'm fantastic, thank you. Great. And also with us today is the lovely AMC movie news editor, Amy Rose Eisenbach. Good morning. How you doing, guys? Fantastic. Let's get started. So according to the film site Twitch, Universal Studios is in simultaneous negotiations with Matt Damon and director Paul Greengrass for both to return to the Bourne franchise. In the past, Damon said he'd be open to returning to the role, but insists he would only want to do it if Greengrass was directing. Following their final Bourne movie, Damon and Greengrass went out to make Green Zone together. Greengrass's next, sorry, Greengrass's next film, Captain Phillips, stars Tom Hanks and hits AMC theaters everywhere on October 11th. As far as Jeremy Renner's Aaron Cross character, Universal is planning to continue with the Aaron Cross stream of Bourne films, regardless of what happens on the Damon front, with potential crossover of the character's stories to be sorted out if and when Damon signs back on. So, John, what do you think about Damon? and Greengrass teaming up again for a Bourne franchise. I think this would be a great thing. I, I think, you know, I I was... There are things I really like about the first couple of Bourne movies. Like, I like the first one very much. Or, sorry, I didn't like the first one all that much. I thought it was okay. I didn't dislike it. I liked the second one a little bit better. But, you know, it was the worst of all films in history... Uh, it became the poster child for that whole, you know, the shaky camera. I was like, oh, there's any action. We got to shake the camera around like that. And I, that is my most annoying peeve of filmmaking today. I hate that. It's lazy filmmaking. It's disgusting. It's terrible. I hate it. But, I mean, there were other really redeeming qualities. And then Born 3 came out, and I loved it. I love Born 3. It's, it toned down the shaky camera. It was still pretty bad, but it toned it down a bit. And, you know, it was better storytelling. It was better pacing. It was better action. It was really solid. So I think a lot of us were looking forward to seeing him again. Now, I'm one of these guys who I did not dislike the Jeremy Renner uh, take on Born as much as most people. I actually was pretty entertained by it. Was it as good as Born 3? No, but I'll, I think it was better than the first Born film. So I'm looking forward to seeing him back, too. I really like the idea of them pulling an Avengers Marvel Universe thing here, have Matt Damon and Paul Greengrass back to do another standalone, and then figure out a way to cross the streams, as it were, to get the two involved again. I think that would be pretty fun to see and pretty entertaining. And watching these two really badass characters, Aaron Cross and Jason Bourne, going to battle together, I just think that would be phenomenal. I think that would look fantastic. Amy Rose, what do you think? Yeah, um, I really like the Bourne franchise with Matt Damon. I love Jeremy Renner as an action star, but I felt like his film just fell a little flat for me. I wanted to love it because I do love the franchise, um, but it just it just didn't work for me. You know, everything was just fell a little flat, a little lackluster, and it was had nothing to do with his lack of talent because I really like him as an action star, as a dramatic actor, everything. I think he's really talented. But yeah, it just it just kind of missed for me. I didn't hate it by any means, but I was definitely disappointed. Um, and the first film, as you mentioned, had a different vibe, and Doug Lehman actually directed that, and then Paul Greengrass went on to direct the next two installments. And I feel like we really felt that because the chemistry between you know Paul behind the helm and with Matt Damon as the star, I just feel like those two films were fantastic, and I loved them. And you know, I think that. In terms of being action stars, they're both really talented, but I don't know, the formula worked better for the last two, in my opinion. All Same right. team. I agree with you guys. I'd love <laughs> to see them do a crossover, Avengers-style, born mashup. That'd be amazing. Um, on to our next story. Lionsgate has just revealed that Steph Dawson has been cast as Annie Cresta, Phoenix, played by Sam Claflin's love interest, in the final two chapters of the Hunger Games series, The Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 1 and Part 2. A native of Australia's capital city, Canberra, Dawson is known for her work on television as well as numerous independent films, including the recent thriller, Wrath. So Amy Rose, what do you think about Dawson joining the cast? I'm a bit indifferent because I really haven't seen much of her work. Um, from her picture, she's she's a pretty lady and <laughs> brings something to it, but, um, but I am familiar with the subject because I read all three of the books and Annie is a very interesting character. She's very complex, you know, 
she's much more than what meets the eye originally, as you learned from Sam's character, um, Finnick. And I definitely think she was one of the, the most interesting parts throughout the series to see once she was introduced, you know, what's real character and, you know, what does the capital want you to see and what really happened. And, you know, there's definitely a lot of political undertones associated with her. Um, so they must have seen something special in her because she's definitely not a boring character by any means. Uh, she's very interesting, very layered, and, uh, you know, I'm happy to give her the benefit of the doubt and, and see what happens because I'm sure her screen tests were amazing. So we'll see. But I'm really excited for, for the next films. Yeah, I, I have seen her work, but not a lot like you, Amy Rose. I haven't seen her exposed a lot. And so I have neither really any strong positive nor negative feelings about her. But, but I will say this. When I think about the character of Annie and I look at her, I see her. I do. Yeah. So I'll at least say that much. I mean, that's not really important in the grand scheme of things. My biggest concern here is still the casting of Sam Kaplan as Finnick. Um, really? They're going to have to sell me on that. Because huh. one of the things... Now, I wasn't thrilled with the second two books. Now, I know that puts me in the minority. I like the first one more than I like the second two books. And First one was the best. No question. Yeah. So I actually ended up... I read the last two books in one weekend sitting at poker tables in Vegas. So, you know, when I wasn't in a hand, I had my iPad out reading my Kindle app, and I got through both books in that weekend. Um, and I had a certain image of Finnick in my head, and I got to admit, right now, I'm not really sold on Sam Kaplan. I know we're supposed to be talking about Dawson here, but um, I'm just not so Because that that's – her Annie is all about uh, – her entire character is defined by what her relationship to Finnick is and that. And so I, I, I'm still not sold on Kaplan. I didn't really like him much in that uh, Snow White – movie um i haven't been thrilled but not really turned off by anything i've seen of him so far so i'm still not i'm apprehensive let's just say that i'm a little apprehensive with high hopes well so, john yeah. let me ask you who'd you rather see in that role when you're reading and you had an image in your mind was there anyone specific i'm gonna humiliate myself here a little bit <laughs> Uh -oh. And I, I forget his name, but I'm sure you ladies will be able to tell me his name okay. instantly. <laughs> but as I'm reading, because my fan, my, my wife is a big fan of Vampire Diaries. And so I have seen a, a, a lot of the episodes. I've seen a lot of the episodes. And when I was reading the books and I reading the character of Finnick, all I ever saw in my head was the one star... Yeah. Of uh, the Ian, Ian, Ian Summerholder. That's that's him. <laughs> Ian Summerholder. That's all I could see in my head was that dude. Mm -hmm. And suddenly now, when your mind, and you know, granted, when your mind set, makes up its mind about something, you then you're automatically dis, you know, kind of uh, disconnected from what actually happens. That's one of the reasons huh. I don't. If if I haven't read a book yet and a movie's coming out, generally speaking, my rule is don't read the book because then your mind creates assumptions. And then the movie will do nothing but disappoint you because it doesn't meet your expectations mm -hmm. or your assumptions, right? So I broke that rule with, with Catching Fire and, and all that kind of stuff. But I just don't see Kathleen. Yeah. All right. Well, we've reached that part of the show for buy and sell. Here's how this is going to work. In front of her, Aaron's got a bunch of other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. And Amy Rose and I are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Aaron, what do we got? Our first item of the day is this story. For over a decade, fans of the comic book character Spawn have wondered if we'd ever see the former assassin turned Hell Spawn return to the big screen again. Well, according to Spawn creator Todd McFarlane, a new Spawn film could possibly be shooting as early as next year. In a recent interview, McFarlane said the following, The thing that keeps slowing it down is that the negotiation I've done is that I write, produce, direct, but I've got to push a lot of my other endeavors off of the side so that I can get tunnel vision on it and so everybody in my company is now going we've got to find Todd the time to finish all this it's not going to be a giant budget with a lot of special effects it's going to be more of a horror movie and a thriller movie not a superhero one so John buy or sell a new Spawn movie with McFarland directing I gotta sell it um, I'm one of these guys who I have been curious about seeing another incarnation of Spawn on the big screen. And to be honest, what McFarlane is describing sounds pretty intriguing. Not really a superhero film, more of a horror thriller kind of thing, a more of a lower budget kind of thing. That sounds intriguing. Why am I selling it? Because he says he's going to write, produce, and direct it. The last time a really great and celebrated comic book author directed a, uh, a film was uh, Miller. Remember when he did the spirit? 
Mm-hmm. Yes, Dear yes. God. <laughs> um, and, you know, Miller, who sat in the little boy's director chair beside Rodriguez when they made Sin City, Sin City, thought, oh, now I can be a director. No, you can't. Continue to be a genius comic book writer, but you are no director. And at some point, McFarlane has come to believe that he can write, produce, and direct. I can direct this. And I think that is going to be a disaster. I hope it's not. I'm going to check it out. I'm going to give it the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to give it a chance. Absolutely. And go into it with an open mind. But in advance, I think this has disaster written all over it. So for me, it's a sell. Amy Rose? Yes, of course, you're going to use Frank Miller as the example. <laughs> um, I Yeah. Well, that's a whole other debate. But anyway, um, I am going to buy it because I do think that, A, I really like what he's describing. And, you know, what I like about Spawn is that he's not this character that has been created, you know, for decades, for decades. He's he's a, he's a fairly newer character in the yeah, 90s. Yeah, relatively and, new, yeah. Yeah, in the 90s. And I, I like the idea of the creator, you know, single-handedly trying to bring his vision to the big screen like that. And obviously he's a solid writer. And, you know, Frank Miller is a whole other case. I mean, he pretty much tried to mirror Rodriguez's style in the spirit. It wasn't even his own style. He tried to mirror it. So he was kind of copying that. But couldn't an argument be made that Rodriguez was just mirroring Miller's comic book style? So wasn't Rodriguez just trying to mirror Miller in the first place? That could be Whoa. a good, yeah, it's a good argument, but <laughs> mind on the big blown. Mind blown. Just got real meta up in here. <laughs> Have, did but you guys ever think about screen? It's a whole different ballpark than you know having come alive. And I love Rodriguez as a director. I loved Sin City, and Miller also is not much of a collaborator. Everything I've read or seen True. about him. So I'm hoping that McFarlane is, and from what it sounds like, he's a fairly humble guy. Again, this is all speculation from what I've read and seen. Um, so I'm hoping that he takes, you know, people who maybe might be a little more polished in directing and all of this stuff, and actually collaborate with them, opposed to Miller, where he's very much my way or the highway. So I'm optimistic. It's being reported that the star of the Jackie Robinson movie 42, Chadwick Boseman, has been cast to play another iconic real-life character, James Brown, in an upcoming untitled biopic of the singer's life. The film will be directed by Tate Taylor, who also directed The Help, and has had Mick Jagger attached to produce. Amy Rose, buy or sell Boseman in the role of James Brown? I'm going to buy this. I thought Bozeman was really, really good as Jack and Robinson in 42. I know some people were disappointed by it, but that's a really difficult subject matter and, you know, time and history and everything to bring to life. And I thought it was a pretty solid, you know, rendition. And I thought he was really, really spectacular. He brought a lot of depth and emotion and everything to that character. And this is going to be a really big challenge. James Brown is a whole other, <laughs> whole other character, very eccentric and iconic. And, I'm really excited. And not to mention Tate Taylor, very, very talented director. So I do think all of the, you know, elements are lined up and uh, having Mick Jagger, Mr. You know, Rock himself also attached to produce. um, I do think this sounds like a fun time and Bozeman is is talented. I'd like to see him try it. I'm going to sell this. Um, I, I was so excited for 42 because the story of Jackie Robinson is one that is so important um, and deserves a, a, a sense of reverence when developing it. And I didn't think Bozeman brought it. I didn't think he brought it at all. I was kind of underwhelmed by how flat his performance was. Uh, now, that's not that's just one movie. That's not to say he couldn't pull out a great performance. But considering my reaction to him in 42 is I thought he was flat and I didn't think he did the character and the real person of Jackie Robinson any justice in the film. Now you're moving to a character like James Brown who has... I mean, he's like flashing exactly. charisma and personality. And considering I, I thought Bozeman did Jackie Robinson really flat, I'm a little bit worried. You're absolutely right. Tate Taylor, I believe, is a great director. I loved the help and what he did with Me that too. film. Um, and, you know, I, I'm dying to see a biopic on the life of James Brown. I think this would be like the hardest working man in entertainment, one of the most iconic <laughs> names in entertainment. I think that will be great. And you know what? Maybe Bozeman will blow our socks off. I'm you just saying, But right now... Talk about... I'm 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 apprehensive. Talk about not being typecast though, right? True. Very true. <laughs> 
All right. Speaking of actors, as most of you know, actor Daniel Craig is set to return for his fourth film as James Bond in the upcoming as of yet untitled 007 film hitting AMC theaters in November of 2015. In a recent interview, Craig suggested that the film may return to a style and elements of some of the older Bond films, but without the campiness. Craig said the following. Hopefully we'll reclaim some of the old irony and make sure it doesn't become pastiche. I can't do shtick. I'm not very good at it. Unless it kind of suddenly makes sense. Does that make sense? I sometimes wish I hammed it up more, but I can't do it very well, so I don't do it. <laughs> Amy Rose, first off, I just got to say, what a weird quote. <laughs> what, what do you think about these comments? What are your thoughts on the matter? I'm going to buy them because I completely know what he's talking about because I love the Bond franchise. I love the evolution of it. And, you know, there were a lot of very tongue-in-cheek elements to it and sexual innuendos and everything. I mean, he's the, the most famous super spy, and that is kind of what made Bond Bond. And I love Craig for knowing his limitations. I love him for knowing this is what I do best. I think he is such an incredible Bond because you believe the action. He's a badass. He could really kick some butt. And he also is very suave and hot with the ladies. So I think he's a really fantastic Bond. And I'm really excited to hear that they're, you know, trying to kind of little tip of the hat, little homage to past films, but I also hope they keep it grounded to where it is because I thought Skyfall was fantastic and I'm so excited excited that Mendez and Craig are back together again. I couldn't be more excited for this film. I got to buy this uh, and mostly because I love it when an actor doesn't think he can do it all. And you know, yeah. and Daniel Craig's one of those guys he goes, "Hey, I know what I'm good at and I know what I'm not good at and I'm not afraid. You know, I'm secure enough to talk about it." I think that's great. And look, I know it almost feels sacrilegious to say, but guess what, folks? Not all the Bond films were great. <laughs> there, are some, there are some, when you go back into the annals of history, there are some very bad Bond films. And a lot of it, I believe, has to do with the overuse of the campiness and the shtick and stuff like, hello, Octopussy. I mean, they're the things you did back then that could be cute and funny. You cannot do today because they're either outrageously offensive or really, really just dumb and silly. And I love the fact that they want to get a little bit of that feel of the older well, style without getting the shtick again, you know? So I, I love it. I love what they're going for. And I think the homage to the past is great. So overall for me, it's a buy. All right. Coming up next, we have Arrested Development, Cur no, sorry. <laughs> Arrested Development creator Mitch Hurwitz has confirmed that he is currently writing the script for a full-length feature Arrested Development movie and hopes to make another season as well. I'm working on the movie right now, he said. I can't get into much more detail because I don't want to scare anybody off and I don't want to be presumptuous about it. I don't own the property outright. It's a 20th Century Fox property, but everybody seems really into it and really eager to make a movie. So John Byers said that we're going to get maybe an Arrested Development movie. Sell, sell, sell. This is <laughs> such great graphic fantasy. I remember back in 2011, there was this big, huge Q&A session with Ron Howard and all the producers and the writers and the actors from Arrested Development, and they did this big, huge thing, and they said, that, yep, we are developing a script for a movie. We hope to be in shooting by it in 2012 for, a, for maybe a late 2013 release. All the actors on board, blah, blah, blah. And I came out and I said, because all the movie news sites ran with this headline, confirmed. Uh, Arrested Development movie is coming because they confirmed it. And I remember I came out and said, like, no, we didn't. No studio has come out and said they're going to pay for this thing. Let's not forget, Arrested Development went off the air for a reason. I love the show. But much like the fact that I love Firefly, like Firefly, nobody watched it. And it got canceled because nobody watched it. Now, everybody has this fantasy that, oh, but now everybody loves it because it became so popular on DVD and so popular on Netflix. We inflate what that really means. So everybody thought when they do the Arrested Development uh, next season on Netflix, which they did, and I was excited to see it, they thought it's going to break the internet. So many people are going to watch it. Guess what? A lot more people watched House of Cards which was the other Netflix original series. Um, so anyway, I came out and said, look, this is not official. The series went off air. The last time a series went off air that got this giant following after it went off air, Firefly, which made the Serenity movie. Guess what? They made Serenity, made like $25 million. Nobody went to go see it. And, and I think the studios remember this stuff. They remember these, these trends and how this really works. So I'm going to say this. 
We heard this song and dance before back in 2011, and obviously it never came to pass. Just like I said, it would never come to pass. Now here we are in 2013, and the guy's saying again, okay, I'm working on a script, and I'm sure there are five movie websites right now that are running the headlines, confirmed Arrested Development movie coming, even though he just said he's writing a script. I don't think it'll ever happen. Um, it's possible, but the biggest hurdle for me is that some studio, let's not forget this. Remember, we're not talking about whether Arrested Development deserves a movie. That's a different question altogether. I think all of us on this panel would like to see an Arrested Development movie. But the number one hurdle continues to be this. They need a studio that says, all right, we will write the 30 million, and I'm being optimistic here, $30 million, keep it low. We will write the $30 million check to produce this movie, and we will write the $25 million to $35 million check to market this movie and distribute the movie and cross our fingers that an Arrested Development movie then would probably require somewhere around $130 million box office to break even. Then that's not going to happen. An mm -hmm. Arrested Development movie will not make $100 plus million dollars at the box office. It's just not. So... I <laughs> But maybe one of these students, maybe Fox, will will go, hey, we just want to do it as a pet project. We know we're going to take a loss on it. We know it's not going to make money. Uh, and maybe they'll do it. And I will love them for it if they do it. But it, that's the type of situation it's going to take for an Arrested Development movie to happen. A studio that just goes, you know what? We're willing to take a loss on this and we'll finance it. Amy Rose, I know you love Arrested Development. What do you think about all this? Bye. Thank goodness I'm here for a of reason. I mean, come on. If I recall, Mr. Campia, I think you didn't believe that there were going to be new episodes either. And look what happened there. No, no, Netflix. I, I said, no, no. I said they could do. No, I said they could do another TV series. Absolutely, I said that's where they mm -hmm. can go. They can do another TV season. I said mm -hmm. never see a movie. Anyway, I'll send you the Netflix. link to the video where I said that directly. Net Netflix has changed the game, they really have. I mean, House of Cards, Orange is the New Black, Arrested Development, and I think it, you know, a lot of people weren't ready for this witty, amazing show when it happened. I felt that way about a lot of shows. And sales did skyrocket more than, you know, they were before. Maybe not as as the hopes would have been, but I definitely think that we could. I mean, same with Entourage. Like, a lot of people are like, that's not happening, but there are steady oh, yeah. movements, and now that the whole cast is on board, which has been the biggest difficulty in locking, I think Michael Sarah was the big diva in this whole negotiation process, if the rumors were true. We don't know, but um, I really want to see this. I think it's such a wonderful, and while you know, I did like this new season, it was not up to maybe the previous seasons, but I do still think they captured the nostalgia, gave us our favorite characters, and I think they could do this pretty much on the cheap. I mean, the biggest expense would be to pay the actors, because think about it. There's not, like, special effects. It's very grounded in reality. I don't really think they need a ton of money to make this movie happen other than the salary. So I'm really optimistic. I want you to be optimistic, too. I really want to see this movie, and uh, I like that all the original, you know, creators and everything are on board, and I'm excited for season two. So come on, John. The problem with TV is this. You can have a show on CW, for example, right, that gets three million viewers a week. And for CW, that's a big hit. Three million viewers a week on a CW show mm -hmm. is a big hit. Here's the problem. This all comes back down to the finances. If every single one of those three million viewers, let's say they did a Supernatural movie, right? If every single one, without exception, all of them, ran out and bought a movie ticket, which they won't, but for argument's sake, let's say they will. That's $30 million box office. Now you're in a position where you have to triple that with people who never were even interested in watching the show in the first place. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a just, it's a tough road to navigate. It's really, really tough. Once again, we're, there, talking, we're not talking about does it deserve a movie. Mm -hmm. We're talking about does it financially really and practically make sense. They're making make another Twilight Zone movie and Leonardo DiCaprio is producing it. So, I mean, it can happen. That's a really different situation. Yeah. You're talking about a 50-year-old hey, TV, TV series, series that has a lot of nostalgia factor now. A long now. time after the shelf life. Totally so different awesome. scenario. Most people who are watching this episode right now are completely siding with Amy Rose. <laughs> let's, let's make no no mis, misrepresentations about John it. John in line sometimes. He yeah. needs it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, so listen, there's a lot of other items in the world of movie news right now. We don't have time to go into all of them, but we want to keep you up to date on what's happening in the world of film. So this is what we call the News Roundup. 
Over the past two years, one of the most secretive projects has easily been the upcoming Disney film Tomorrowland being helmed by The Incredibles and Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol director Brad Bird. Now, according to a press release from the company, shooting on the film has finally begun. Tomorrowland stars George Clooney and Hugh Laurie and is written by Brad Bird and Damon Lindelof and will hit AMC theaters everywhere in December 2014. The upcoming Seth Rogen, Zac Efron film Townies has just officially changed its name. According to reports, the film will now simply be called Neighbors. Neighbors is directed by Forgetting Sarah Marshall, <coughs> Get Him to the Greek, and the five-year engagement director Nick Stoller, and follows a young couple suffering from arrested development who are forced <laughs> to live next to a fraternity house after the birth of their newborn baby. Neighbors hits AMC theaters everywhere on May 9th, 2014. It's a sign. Our first look at the upcoming Matthew McConaughey Dallas Buyers Club has hit the web and it looks just amazing. There are a number of Hollywood insiders who are claiming McConaughey could possibly be nominated for Best Actor at the upcoming Academy Awards twice, once for his film Mud and once for Dallas Buyers Club. It's being reported that the actor drops down to 135 pounds for the role. Based on a true story, the film stars Matthew McConaughey as a t- who, after being diagnosed with AIDS in 1986, began to smuggle alternative and illegal treatments into the U.S. and into the hands of other patients. Dallas Buyers Club opens in limited release on November 1st. You go, McConaughey. I'm proud of you. Not all superhero movies belong to DC or Marvel. It's being reported that CBS Films has plans to bring Split, an original superhero movie, to the big screen. Split follows a young orphan who is contacted by an identical twin she never knew she had. When the two meet, they discover that they share superhuman abilities and wind up on the run from powerful pursuers. I know what you're all thinking. Wonder Wonder Twin Twin Powers Powers activates. activates. (laughs) Two-time Oscar nominee Naomi Watts' new film, Diana, has set a release date at last. Diana follows the last two years in the life of Princess Diana. In the wake of Diana's shattering divorce from Prince Charles and at the moment when she stood on the cusp of a different life, evolving into a global humanitarian, humanitarian, mastering her fame and becoming her own woman. Diana opens in limited release on November 1st. Texas Chainsaw 3D star Scott Eastwood has reportedly joined the cast of the upcoming World War II film Fury. The film stars Brad Pitt, Shia LaBeouf, Logan Lerman, and Michael Pena. Fury follows the battle-hardened war daddy who commands a Sherman tank and his five-man crew on a deadly mission behind enemy lines. Outnumbered and outgunned, war daddy and his men face overwhelming odds in this in their heroic attempts to strike at the heart of the Nazi Germany. Fury hits AMC theaters November 14th, 2014. Sounds awesome. Hey guys, I have a question for you. What's that? Would you sleep in a small square pipe infested with rats with spiders crawling all over you? (laughs) Normally, no. Anybody? No. (laughs) Amy Rose? Hell nah. No? All right. Well, would you do it for a Scooby snack? Hell yes. <laughs> That's Woo! right. Variety is reporting that a brand new Scooby-Doo animated film is heading for AMC theaters. That's right. Animated, not live action, guys. Don't worry. There are no details yet about the project or if the film will be done with CG or classical hand-drawn animation. And that'll do it for the news roundup. All right, folks. Well, we've reached that part of the show for Mailbag. Hey, listen. If you've got a topic or a question you would like us to address on AMC Movie Talk or AMC Mailbag, send it on in to amcmovietalk at gmail.com. Now, every day we take a couple questions from the mailbag. Right now, Aaron's got a couple messages pulled out. So, Aaron, what do we got? Our first message comes from Nick Naranjo. I'm hoping I pronounced your name right, Nick. I'm sorry if I didn't. But he writes and says, Hello, AMC Movie Talk. I have been seriously addicted to your show for months now. Keep up the great work. My question revolves around Henry Cavill as Superman. Do you believe when Henry is done playing the Man of Steel in sequels and Justice League movies that he could go down as a better Superman than Christopher Reeve? I know it seems crazy, but I thought Henry was fantastic in Man of Steel, and I could see him go down as the best Superman ever, and I would love to hear your thoughts. Thanks. Um, it's, it's a fair question, and I, I'm going to answer it with this. If you're asking the question, could Henry Cavill go, to, go down as a better Superman than Christopher Reeve, if you are logical, um, the answer has to be yes. He could. It is very possible. Now, that sounds sacrilegious to a lot of people. But the reality is, let's look back at the Christopher Reeve Superman films. It was a different era for Superman. It was the, gosh, 
golly, Lois, what are we doing now? I mean, that was the Superman he was asked to play. And that is the Superman he played. And, and, you know, other than Superman 2, when you look back now at a lot of the performances and whatever, they they are kind of cheesy. Now, once again, that's what he was asked to do. That was the Superman they wanted back then. They wanted the, you know... Get the kitten from the tree, the cooling off the apple pie. That's the Superman they wanted. This is a different Superman. So it's a little bit of an apples to oranges situation. But I loved the the Man of Steel. I thought it was wonderful. And I think if Henry Cavill and DC and Warner makes three or four or five more Superman films, whether they be standalone films or crossovers with Batman or Justice League, then yeah, I absolutely believe he is in a position where he could go down as a better Superman than Christopher Reeve. We have to see two or three more films to really Mm -hmm. get an idea, but I think he could. Amy Rose, how do you see it? Yeah, I think you nailed it perfectly. I mean, right now, I haven't seen enough from him to determine that. I need to see more. And, you know, it will be very telling to see him really take on Clark Kent because we didn't get that in the first film. It was kind of... And leading up to, you know, his work at the Daily Planet and all that good stuff. And I definitely think that... You know, it will be very telling to see him in the second one, to see him and how Spider-Man, excuse Spider-Man, blah, Avengers Assemble, <laughs> to see how Superman and Batman, you know, fight and brawl it out and just to see his chemistry as Affleck and everything. I think it'll be very telling to see, you know, with new actors brought in and just to show his depth because they didn't give him, I really liked Man of Steel, but again, it was a lot of action heavy. I mean, I didn't see him, I thought he was really solid, but I want to see him continue with the character development and then I feel like I'll be able to determine because, you know, Reeve is as good as it gets and he definitely is still associated with Superman. So I, I do, I am co- optimistic that he could become the best, but again, I haven't seen enough yet and I'm really excited to see this franchise continue to develop. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Nick, I think it's way too soon to tell, but I love the fact that you're obviously loving the Man of Steel movies. I did too, so we have that in common. Our next question comes from Jamie Temples, who writes, Hello, with lots of O's. AMC Movie (laughs) Talk crew, I hope you all are doing well. My question is regarding the new Tomb Raider film. I've recently read that they're planning to do either a sequel or a reboot of the franchise, and seeing as how I love the 2013 video game reboot, I'm very much looking forward to this possible film. Let me know what you guys think. I love hearing everyone's insights and opinions. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, as far as whether it's a sequel or reboot, they are rebooting Tomb Raider. They're rebooting it much... They're going to keep it in line with the new video game franchise, as a matter of fact, which makes sense because my brother-in-law just played the free demo and then called me and said, this is the greatest game I've ever played. So clearly, they're doing something right, right with it. It wasn't a sequel. It was a rebooted game franchise, so they're rebooting the movie franchise. I love that they're doing this again for a couple of reasons. Number one... Uh, my One of my mantras is that all video game movies suck. But if I had to say one that was pretty tolerable, it might be the first Tomb Raider movie. Mm-hmm. I thought the first Tomb Raider movie was pretty tolerable, actually. And so it obviously can do great. But number two, we've been talking a lot on this show in recent weeks about where are the strong female heroes or even the strong female villains. We've talked about that as well. I think it's great that they are stepping up again and bringing us another strong female hero because... It looks like Wonder Woman ain't happening anytime soon. Uh, Other than that, Laura Croft, do her right. Look, if they can make a hit film, if they make a hit film that does really well with Laura Croft and they set that precedent that guess what? You can have a $200 million profit movie with a female lead action star. I think you're going to see the lid blown off. And I think you're going to see a lot more diversity in these films, which we are overdue for. Look, I've always said this. I get it. I get why the studios are apprehensive. There have been track records of poorly performing female-led films because the audience won't give it a chance. But a hit Tomb Raider film, I think it changes the game. Amy Rose, how do you see it? Yeah, I loved the the newest game. I thought it was really good. And I also love how they kind of, again, show more of the origin. It's a younger Lara Croft. And I really liked that. And I think that really opens the door for a new actress to kind of take it on. Because I loved Angelina Jolie as that. She is a badass babe. And she really embodied what I wanted that character to embody. And obviously it wasn't a colossal failure because they made two of them. So um, I definitely think that's a good example of a pretty strong female-fronted action movie. Um, 
Katniss Hunger Games. There are a few of them out there. But uh, I definitely would like to see, I'm glad this is being rebooted, and I think it's really cool that, you know, it's not going to be the Lara Croft we saw before because it is younger, how she kind of became this, you know, timid and then evolved into this, like, badass femme fatale. And, uh, you know, on this quest, archaeologists, all this good stuff. So it's a great game. It's it's pretty much better in every way. Graphics, everything. Technology is incredible. So love the game. Excited for the reboot. And, uh, yeah, I think it's going to be good. Now the question is, who should play her? Jennifer Lawrence. No. Oh, God, please no. I think so. I think you need a big name to get a movie like I, this. I love her, but I think we don't, you know, there are other badass females that can lead a film, not just Katniss, even though I love Jennifer Lawrence. She's as cool as it gets. Oh, yeah. Don't get me wrong when I when I bemoan the, the name of Jennifer Lawrence, but just yeah. Jennifer Lawrence is turning, into, is turning into a Peter Jackson name where it's like, you know, you ask any fan, who should direct this? And everybody just automatically says Peter Jackson, regardless. Of but the, that that's also happening with Gosling and Fassbender. Well, so it's no, on no, both no, sides. It is too, it they is, are, it they're is. in the running for everything. Yeah, and, and that's, and I don't like that either. And with Jennifer Lawrence, as great of an actress as she is. I I don't see her at all. When I look at her, I don't see this super hyper athletic uh, type. And, and you know she's she's played athletic roles, and we know she can do it. But I I no, I want a British woman, and I want somebody um, a little more who looks like who looks not acts like it, but looks like I, they're an athlete. As I have a name. Whatever. I think Gemma a church run would be great. Oh, she's oh, great. She's really good. I love her. I think you, she'd be great. You're not the first person to mention that. All right, folks, listen, we've gone way over time. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, while I've got you, if you're not already a subscriber to our YouTube channel, take a second and click on that subscribe button. Become a subscriber to our AMC Movie News YouTube channel. It'll keep you up to date on everything going on in the world of movie news and, of course, our daily AMC Movie Talk Show and our weekend AMC Mailbag Show. Make sure you follow us on Twitter and follow us on Facebook. If you want an audio-only version of this episode, look down in the description of this video and you'll find links to our iTunes and our Stitcher radio. I want to thank, as always, first of all, our lovely host today, Miss Erin Darling. Erin, where can people find you online? Twitter at Erin A. Darling, Facebook Erin Darling fan page, and, of course, on YouTube at Erin Ashley D. Thanks, guys. The news editor for AMC Movie News, Miss Amy Rose Eisenbach. Amy Rose, where can people find you? On Twitter and Instagram at Amy Rosie. And you can find me on Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, wherever, at, at John Campia. Thanks a lot for joining us, guys. My name is John Campia for AMC Movie News, and until tomorrow, bye-bye.